because the health and fitness world can get a little nutty, it's time for body kindness. Today we're going to talk about finally saying I'm sorry to your body. And we'll also discuss why you should do it and how it's going to help you with your body kindness practice. Hello and welcome to Body Kindness, where happiness and health begin by being good to yourself. I'm your host, your coach, and your guide, Rebecca Scritchfield, and I have Bernie Salazar here with me today once again. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, well, I just want to dive right in. I know we haven't talked in a couple weeks, and I just wanted to check in, Bernie, with you on how you're doing with your body kindness goals. Um, what do you care about? We made it through uh, our sleep challenge and, um, you know, kind of rolling our way here through the last few days of summer. So how are you doing and um, what's most important to you right now? You know, I feel really good about myself uh, right now. I've been getting a lot more uh, movement in. Uh, I'm actually in the process of packing. I'm getting ready to move here soon. So uh, a lot of um, unplanned activity has been going on, which is welcomed in my world because uh, being forced to move when maybe normally I would have claimed that I didn't have time. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I and no, my you know, my dad is a is um a janitor. And so when he started doing that job like eight hours a day, he was like, I'm losing weight, help. And the problem was he was just burning so much more than he did in his sedentary job. So. No, absolutely. I'm telling you, I'm going up and down with boxes. I'm I'm getting rid of things that I probably should have a long time ago. Um it, and that being said, so let's, you know, talking about body kindness, I am getting rid of some of uh, maybe those uh, smaller size clothes along with some bigger size clothes that I just continue to hang on to. Um, but when you're moving, you know, it's a time to really kind of just clear the palate and, and start afresh. So uh, I'm excited to get rid of those things. And I'm also excited about getting some new stuff. <laughs> that's a that's the kind of cleanse I can get behind. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you know what? Not just me. My wife's really excited about it as well. So it's going to prove to be costly. I think it's great when you can let go of things you're holding on to unnecessarily. And um, have you heard of Marie Kondo's book? Um, what is that? Oh, the life changing magic of tidying up. Have you heard of that book? No, but I can get behind it. I, I, I'm a self-proclaimed uh, neat freak. Yes, there's some funny uh, articles about it because it's I I got it, and I'll admit I I skimmed through it to get the gist. Being a busy mom of um, two young kids, and I actually did embrace some of her folding techniques, and and, and I get generally what she said. There were there was a lot, you know. I mean, there was stuff like if you cleanse like this, you know, some clients have had you know, digestive cleansing and like diarrhea for days or something like that. <laughs> so there was some stuff that I was like, okay, it's a little too hocus pocus for me. And some people, I mean, it's a multi bestseller. Some people really swear by, um, swear by it. But one of her key things is, um, letting go of what doesn't spark joy. And I think that's a great idea and mindset to have around that we can collect lots of stuff and certainly when we're working on well-being and health transformation and absolutely when you go from um, diet culture and weight cycling and rigidity and move more toward a body kindness approach where you embrace mindfulness and intuitive eating, there's going to be things that you uh, don't need anymore and that you let go of, whether it's books, you know, calorie counters, scales, food scales, whatever. Um, and you know, it's certainly a good time and opportunity to ask yourself, you know, does this spark joy? Does this create value in my life? Does this make me, um, a happier, a healthier person? Um, or even just more simply, is this helpful? And, you know, one of the key, you know, that is, it's like a key question in, in body kindness does this help me create a better life? And if it doesn't, I think that's when you need to reevaluate. Yeah, see, I can get behind that part. I think the earlier part where you were talking about maybe diarrhea for days, I just don't see how that's joyful. Um, yeah, it seems a little bit excessive, but I'll have to look into it. You know, I don't want to form an opinion just yet, but um, I, I, that just kind of stuck with me. Maybe if I ever start a band, that'll be the name. Yeah. Well, 
updating you on what I've been doing um, actually leads us into why I wanted to uh, do this um, apology type of podcast today. Uh, I recently went back to um, a place that I spent my childhood. And so I'm from Austintown, Ohio. And uh, we spent a lot of time, my grandparents had a trailer on uh, Berlin Lake. And we spent a lot of time growing up on the lake. Uh, so I remember spending some weeks and weekends during the summer at the camper with my grandparents. We would go a lot of weekends um, all summer long and into the fall. And we would boat and fish and hang out and play. And it was a very important part of my childhood. And um, I went back, actually, with my two girls, uh, who are two and four. And I kind of had a very um, cathartic experience there. And I originally blogged about it on Medium. And I thought that I would start our episode by reading what I wrote as a way to kick off our conversation. Yeah, I, I think I, I really can't wait for you to read this to our, our listeners because uh, just for all of you out there, Rebecca sent this over to me and uh, I was uh, seriously moved by it and it, it really resonated with me. I know it's going to resonate with a lot of our listeners and, and uh I can't wait to talk to you a little bit about how I related to what you wrote, but let me go ahead and let you share the listeners right now. Okay. Uh, it's called Finally Saying I'm Sorry to My Body. I wore a bathing suit this weekend. While that's not unusual for me, a water-loving mom of two girls just learning to swim, this was definitely different. This weekend, I returned to the place my body hatred began. When I first feared becoming fat, when I got the urge to watch myself around food, to promise I would exercise off whatever I just ate, and where I started to believe I was more lovable when I felt thin. I came to apologize and to make amends with a younger version of myself, a girl I know was innocently trying to do the right things, but instead she got it all twisted and became another victim of our society's harsh judgment of females. We're only good when we look great, or at least putting all our effort in the pursuit. As I stood there gazing at the glass-like surface of the water, feeling the tug of each daughter's hand wrapped around my index fingers, I wondered, how did I go from the curly-haired, curious girl who spent hours making ashtrays for my grandpa from the beach clay to the one who congratulated herself for eating less than everyone else at the picnic or chastised herself for eating too much? The truth is, I really don't know. Something took hold the summer of 1990 that would lead to years of hurtful self-talk, lots of dieting, and a years-long sadomasochistic relationship with a scale. It was probably orthorexia before it became an actual word. I ate healthy food when it was around, but calorie counting, i.e. intentional food restriction, was my jam. I chose exercise classes over time with friends to crank up my calorie burn. I hid my disordered behaviors well in my normal-looking body. And nobody, not even my best friend, heard me say out loud the mean words I said to myself. The way I lived my life wasn't in the spirit of good health and only fueled my bad body image. I was building a tiny room, brick by brick, with every new rule I created. It became my own little prison that kept me from fully experiencing life at 12, 13, 14, and many years to come. It was that piece of cake I avoided at the birthday party, the dance I didn't attend, and the food I ate in secret because I was starving. My body image problems stayed with me throughout high school and college. If I'm 100% honest, they're still there, but different, like a shadowy part of my past capable of rearing its ugly head once in a while. Well, part of me wants to say, hey, be grateful you never had an eating disorder. I am, but that's actually not good enough for me. I spent years entangled in body dissatisfaction disguised as healthy habits. It wasn't dedication or discipline, it was a delusion. I wasn't taking care of myself the ways one should, making choices from a place of love and respect. I wasn't connecting to my body to respond to its needs. I was disassociating from it to somehow make it better, prettier, and more worthy. 
The reality is I was just a girl in a body, no better or worse than anyone else, perfectly unique and perfectly normal. The real beauty in life is in our diversity of body shapes and sizes and our freckles, wrinkles, and bumpy noses. We don't need Photoshop. We don't need to Photoshop a more perfect version of who we really are. We need to be a true friend to ourselves. We need to treat our bodies with kindness. And when we do, the choices we make are naturally good for us. It would take decades for me to learn this lesson. Even building a career in nutrition and fitness wasn't enough. I needed to find my happiness and satisfaction in the study of positive psychology, the practices of mindfulness and self-acceptance, yoga, and the school of not giving a damn about what other people think anymore. Standing there on the shore, a grown woman with more confidence and compassion than my childhood self, I held my emotional battle scars as evidence of the most meaningful insight of my life. You can't hate yourself healthy, but you can drop your weapons, call a truce, and move forward. So I did. There was no ceremonious baptism in the waters absolving me of my body sins. It was more like a silent, gentle embrace with my inner child. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm glad you're okay. I love you. And then it was over. This weekend I wore a bathing suit at Berlin Lake. I cried a mixed emotion of sadness for my suffering and gratitude for the strength it gave me. Because of my difficulties, I will make sure my children grow to love and respect their bodies, even as they change, even when they don't like what they see in the mirror. I will teach them it's okay to feel uncomfortable, imperfect, ugly, or gross. Those feelings are fleeting moments bound to be replaced by more positive emotions after a caring word of self-love, a tiny moment to pause and tell the feeling, I'm with you, stay as long as you need. I'll be eating what I want, moving for my health, and making ashtrays from clay for fun. If you have made it this far, dear reader, I know you can relate to my story. Here's my wish for you a challenge of sorts. Summer technically ends on Thursday, September 22nd, 2016 at 10.22 a.m. precisely. The way I see it, you have until then to get in your bathing suit and make peace with your inner child or any version of yourself you have wronged. You need to have your moment so you can feel the freedom of forgiveness and brick by brick release yourself from your isolation. There's no complicated list of steps to follow, just one simple action. Say I'm sorry, really mean it, and get back to your life. Awesome. That was that was amazing. And I, I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing that, writing that, putting that down. Um, when you sent it over, you know, um, it's just so powerful. And it definitely resonated with me as well. You know, of course, everybody's situation is slightly different. But how many of us out there really are our own worst critics, um, so much so that kind of like you said in your in your um, post, that even our best friends and our closest family members don't even realize how mean we actually are to ourselves in what we say and how we treat ourselves. Um, then this is not that it should be different, but society looks at it as different. But even from a male perspective, there's so many times that, you know, we aren't as open with our, our emotions or, or prompted to be as open with these types of feelings and words that we use against us. Um, I was definitely moved by this. I'm, I'm moved by the challenge that you have to actually do this. Uh, it made me think, Rebecca, of the fact that I've been living where I currently am for uh, quite some time now. I have a pool and have never gotten in it. And uh, not that my story needs to relate to water the ways yours did, but um, there were times throughout my life where I was embarrassed to take off my shirt or to be in shorts or to, you know, I didn't have that beach body that other people had. And I remember being made fun of as a child and then starting to believe those things and uh, even judging myself worse than I had ever been judged by anybody else. And uh, I can honestly say that I haven't gone swimming for 25, 27 years. Why? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that I I just 
kind of got turned off to. I mean, when I say I haven't gone, I've, I've been forced to go. I was on a, a show, um, and they made you get in the pool. But I remember uh, hopping in there with a shirt on or with some type of a compression shirt over it and really dreading every moment of it as opposed to enjoying it. I never understood people splashing around, around in water. Uh, I live in Southern California. I have never been in the ocean. <laughs> uh, I just don't, I just don't, I don't want to. <laughs> so you, know, you don't uh, like water or you're avoiding it because you're of a lack of confidence or compassion I for just, your parents? I just don't feel, I guess, I, you know, over the years, going back to your letter, I just kind of feel like I, I, I mean... I almost have this weird scenario playing in my mind that I'm going to be having a great time at the beach, you know, doing the whole like beach volleyball thing, running around, maybe grabbing a, a little uh, a board and, and going in and out of the water and having the best time of my life. And then just hearing somebody comment, gosh, look at that guy, you know, like, oh, gosh, or don't look at that guy or don't look that way, you know, and these are just self-imposed negative type talk that that I, that, uh, I know I, I can't be the only one out there thinking this way, but it has seriously affected my ability to, to, to just enjoy life, <laughs> um, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, so when you wrote this, I, 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 I related it to, to that situation in, in my life and, and have started to think, well, how else ha has, has me not apologizing, uh, to myself for the negative talk that I, I, I'm responsible for, because you know what, and I might've small little, uh, comments of judgment may have been directed in my way when I was younger, but I'm the one who have turned them into full blown conversations and stories that have never unfolded, you know, just horrible negative stories that I'm fearing will happen, but never have happened. Well, what do you, this is interesting. Thank you for sharing as well. What do you think is the worst that could happen if you were to go to the beach, play around in the ocean for a little bit. What's what's the what is the worst thing that could happen? Yeah, I mean, again, I think for me it was always just the the or the gawks or the looks or the stares or the pointing or the laughing type scenarios. Um, I mean, I've gone, I've, I've walked on the beach. The closest I've gotten to the water is you know kind of doing the shoreline a bit, but, um, I guess what I did, you know, I allowed all that, that negative self-talk to turn into convincing myself that I, I, I probably would enjoy it anyways. It's one of those, well, um, it reminds me of a, of a, um, line from a movie, um, swingers back in the day with John Favreau and, and all that. And they're at parties and, and, whenever they get bored of them or they always say this place is dead anyway. So I almost think like, that's what I, I, I kind of said when it came to doing stuff at the beach, yeah, that, that would be boring anyways, you know, and, and just kind of talk myself out of even enjoying it or looking into it. So where are you at? Like with your body, does it feel like you guys are friends? Are you still like, um, yeah, I mean, I am definitely a lot friendlier with who I am and with my body than uh, I have been in, in a long time, a long, long time. And, um, you know, I definitely credit that to uh, the work that we've done. Uh, so I guess, you know, to answer your question, I just never thought about confronting or going and enjoying myself at the beach be after having already you know starting to be in a better place i didn't think to myself man i can't wait till i'm in a better place i can go to the beach i just know that i'm starting to feel better about myself i know that the conversation i'm having with myself are so much more nurturing caring and kind um but because uh i i've never really known what it is to enjoy the beach i didn't think to myself you know what let me let me tackle that let me look into that let me re engage in, in what that could be. Yeah. It, it, no, I think you nailed it. I think that you have habituated, um, well, okay. What is a habit is avoiding going the beach to the point where you don't even think about it. So, and that's actually what makes something a habit is when, when you don't have to 
overthink about the practice, right? Like flossing your teeth. Oh, I got to floss my teeth. Oh, I got to floss my teeth. Oh, I got to floss my teeth. And then one day you just do it in the shower because that's how you get it done. And you don't have to Mm -hmm. work so hard to think about it. So you don't have to work so hard to think about, um, you know, doing things that involve, um, you know, being, I guess, in vulnerable situations with your body because you've habituated Absolutely. Just yeah. There's no it. way that I miss it. I don't think about it. It's funny because my brother came out to visit me and he's like, hey, you you literally live right by the ocean. You know, I mean, we purposely got a place within walking distance to the ocean um, and I, I never go. I mean, uh, we'll drive along it. You know, we will walk our dogs, uh, um, you know, uh, around the, the area. Now we'll we'll stroll the baby Um, um buy it but we've never gone swimming as a family or even sat out at the beach which is really sad to me i think that's what's starting to you know the, the seeing you uh if, if listeners if you if you go and you actually um look at this article that rebecca posted up she has a great picture of her and her um children with her and and i think that that's that picture resonated with me because um that is a, a very important moment that you're sharing with your daughters that again as i um discover and continue to discover fatherhood and what that means to me and the experiences that I'm hoping to form with my daughter, I don't want these blocks that I have uh, to affect her for for her to ever even think to not engage in doing something that's so so fun and, and so um, so necessary, uh, I, I feel, uh, in growing up and, and identifying who she's going to be. Yeah. Well, the other interesting thing I think that is I think that's so the reason why this has become a habit is it starts with a thought and well I guess thoughts that then trigger feelings right so you have this feelings and thought combo and it basically is communicating danger right don't go out on the beach someone might make fun of you someone you know someone might hurt your feelings it could be a terrible experience and so you have these negative thoughts that create negative feelings and they kind of bounce off of each other, right? The more that is repeated, it becomes a belief. And so I think you actually believe it's, it's almost beyond a fear because a fear might be like, you know, fear, it might be irrational, right? Like, oh, yeah, somebody might, um, you know, snicker, but that's not going to get in the way. You know, if they do, forget them. That's not going to get in the way of me enjoying Mm -hmm. my life and me living my life. But it's like you've, you know, you you feel it's an intense level of a fear that if it is enough to trigger you to avoid engaging in your life, even if there is a risk of somebody doing something hurtful, um, but that by repeating that, it becomes a belief. And our beliefs are very strong. When we have a belief, if our behavior is different, we're going to change our behavior to align the belief. So your, your behavior, avoiding the beach, right, is aligned with the belief that I need to avoid the bleach so that I can avoid being hurt by somebody. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I, I get that, and it's, it's weird too, Rebecca, because, I mean, you know me, I, I would rather I would rather sing in front of a crowd of 10,000 people knowing that I cannot sing mm-hmm. than go to the uh, to a private beach. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I would rather do that. But it's oh, just it's... to be clear, it's not that you don't like sand or like the water or don't no, like I to mean, swim. I, I, it has I nothing, know. it's purely no. body for you. I can, I can swim. I remember, you know, I want to say when I, last time I remember actually enjoying s- swimming, uh, my cousins had a pool growing up and I would, you know, we'd go, we'd visit, we'd make it a point. We'd spend all day in the pool, you know, Marco Polo running around. I mean, we had a great time. Um, and I don't know what triggered it. I mean, maybe it was that whole middle school gym class pool thing. You know, I, I uh, maybe it was, yeah, going to a beach when I was young. I don't, there wasn't one event that I remember. Um, but I do know that uh, I did at one point enjoy it. I'm not scared of the water. I'm not particularly fond of sand, but I'm not like disgusted by it either. Um, 
but I do look very awkward, you know, the, uh, just at at the beach trying to put down a beach towel. I remember one time my wife, uh, early in our <laughs> dating, uh, because she's a Southern California girl, was like, hey, let's go sit at the beach. And of course, I'm going to entertain the idea because I was madly falling in love with her. Um, and I remember trying to put the towel down and it was just blowing every rich way. And it kind of reinforced, it's like, this is why I don't like the beach. It's help. I was like, why couldn't we have just chose a, a, an awesome restaurant where... <laughs> Well, you know, the other thing that I find actually, I'm, I'm glad you can relate to me sharing my story and it has taken me a long time to actually, you know, um, I don't even want to say feel ready because I don't think I was ready when I hit publish, <laughs> but just mm -hmm. feel okay. like it was time to do this and also let the world know. Um, I just felt like I, it was something that I needed to do to continue to move on is to own part of my past. I think it's part of what makes me who I am today. Um, but there's a key difference in what I think I'm writing about and what you're sharing as your experience in that I could actually, so I was not taking care of my body. I mean, I was talking mean to myself. I was giving myself all these rules. I was saying this was about health and it wasn't. It was about trying to feel good enough and everything like that. But like I could hide it because I didn't look like I was suffering and that mm -hmm. helped me in my isolation. Um, but what's different is in your lived experience, it's not something you can hide. Do you no, see no, no, what no. I'm saying? Yeah. So I, it's, it's, I think that they're similar experiences. It's about befriending yourself. It's about, you know, truly giving yourself a good life by doing the things you want, practicing self-compassion, letting joy be joy. Um, but our society is very much one it's you know the most important thing for women is to focus on appearance that's our society to man but for men it's to show power and strength and men are allowed to be vulnerable and I also in in general society does not accept that people come in different shapes and sizes and so you're dealing with this double battle of weight stigma in in culture telling you you should be ashamed of your appearance you're, mm -hmm. You don't care about yourself. Um, and then plus in exposing skin like on the beach or pool or all these things, you're not allowed to be a vulnerable person. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I absolutely agree with what you just said. And, and I think that that's why, you know, there were particular uh, parts of, of your story that resonated. I mean, the whole uh, part, especially about, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, you are a grown woman now, and one of the things that has brought you to really uh, being able to make peace with this and, and apologize to yourself was just f finally not really giving a damn about what other people thought. And and it's so funny when you say it, you're like, yeah, but I mean, when you really think about that, that's a very that's a very hard thing to do and, and, a, and a wonderful place to arrive at, you know, um, is to just be genuine to yourself and to be able to say, you know what, I really don't care what you think, you know, so long as it's something that brings me joy, that's kind to, to my body and that enriches my life. And and that was ex extremely important to read. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, that that part definitely resonated. Yeah. Well, and, I, I definitely changed as a person and it was it was really an evolution but I spent most of my life hating my body and different parts and dieting and calling it health and helping people diet and calling that healthy and like I mean you know you know people know who they are when they got the diet version of Becky and I am so sorry for I you know <laughs> doing that to you um you know it, it, but um it's there it wasn't you know a magical overnight thing um it, i definitely think it took so many different factors of influence and books and mentors and empowerment and body positivity and it just took um a big 
effort into building self-compassion and a true, you know, value system off of respecting myself and being passionate about looking out for my well-being. And it, it, it expanded beyond appearance and, you know, this is about well-being. And it, it, it certainly so many different things influenced me, it, way too many to discuss on one podcast, but I think that it's important to acknowledge that, you know, the difficulty did teach me more about who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do with my own life and my family and out in this world. And 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 for that, I've got to find some gratitude um, and, you know, hopefully we can make things different and create a better world. Um, but it, I would say at the, at the core, it is a relationship with yourself. And one of my clients said the most important relationship is the one you have with yourself. And that is a quote yeah. that resonates well with her. And I do think that that is at the, at the center. The difficulty is the messages you're going to receive whether it's from people you trust like friends and family or doctors that you should trust that really um, just say hurtful, negative things, you know, uh, you know, and I've heard horror stories from clients like a doctor saying, oh, you know, I hope to see less of you next time I see you, like just completely out of nowhere and, um, you know, really end up hurting people. So... And I think that's the point that I wanted to make. I did learn to accept that people would hurt me in my life and I couldn't control it. Um, and there have been times that I've been hurt when I was pregnant and at doctor's appointments, they said hurtful things. Um, I've had clients who are really struggling with eating disorders that really were struggling to grasp recovery, who said negative things about me and my appearance and body, and that's how I knew I didn't know what I was talking about. I wasn't an expert because I didn't look a certain way. Um, and, and there's been lots of ways that people have hurt me. But once I gave up that sense of control, it's not my job to prevent myself from getting hurt. It's my job to know when I'm hurt, to accept that it's okay to get hurt, and then to bounce back by being good to myself and hugging myself and working my way through what I need to do to be resilient and bounce back from whatever hurt comes my way. And you really can't avoid pain. And you and I have talked there are several now podcasts that have documented us discovering together that one of the ways that you keep yourself protected is through avoidance. Mm -hmm. and, and you cannot avoid pain in any form. Pain is inevitable. It's the suffering that's avoidable. And I see pain when you think about the fear of what people might say about your body, because that would hurt. But it's suffering when you avoid engaging in your life with your daughter, with your wife, with people you care about. That is what the suffering is. No, that's 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 really interesting. You know, I hadn't I hadn't really carried it over into that aspect of some of my past. <laughs> um, um, yeah. And just to some of my past, you know, but uh, again, through this process and, and through our time together and, and thankfully through participating in this podcast, I've really been able to kind of uh, uh, look at those past experiences and realize that, you know, there's there's definitely more work to be done. And, and in this article, Rebecca, what I find to be super amazing is the fact that you see your evolution and you see um the thought process of, of, of your life and what you've gone through and, um, and where you've arrived in that, in that split second that you maybe didn't, like you said, plan for, um, but you knew had to be done. And, and I think that 
you know, far too often in, in our hustle and bustle, you know, we we do arrive places and maybe those places are positive and bravo, you know, for everybody who's able to be in a more positive place than they once were. But, you know, in, in reading this, what I also found powerful was the fact that you also acknowledge some of, of your past missteps. And you've always been great about acknowledging those, to be honest. And even, you know, and that's what I find just really great working with you. And I'm just going to be very frank about this is, you know, you just apologized. Our listeners, did you catch that? She just apologized to some of her past clients for if they got the, you know, the old Rebecca that, you know, preached maybe calorie counting or things, you know, to that effect. Um, And I'll tell you what, you don't really encounter that too much in the real world. People going back and saying like, hey, yeah, I messed up, but here I am now and I've learned from it, you know, um, especially when when uh, they are in a position like you are, Rebecca, I mean, you're coming out with your first book, you know, you're, you're doing great for yourself. And that's, you know, been a lot of hard work and a lot of study and a lot of um, true compassion for what it is that you do. Um, so for me, you know, it made me also think to myself, gosh, you know what, let me go ahead and revisit uh, how I got to maybe where I am um, and and start forgiving the, the different, you know, uh, points throughout my life that, that maybe I... I have overlooked, but I know are seriously impacting or have impacted, you know, who I am as an adult. Can, can you, I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, I love to do that. Um, of course. <laughs> yes. Can you think of one or maybe two scenarios that you feel sort of ready to apologize for now? I mean, I know you can't write a letter on the spot or anything, but like, is are, are there any particular instances where you would like to say you're sorry to your body, whether it was, you know, something general or more specific that may be a regret? Uh, Something about my body. Um, I... I, I don't know, Rebecca. I, I think something that, um, you know, I haven't really talked about ever, um, but it, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily in relation to my body, but I know that um, when I was younger, I did um, experience um, some physical abuse. Um, and uh, I, I think that as a result of that, you know, I was left with feelings of, of not necessarily being adequate or doing things wrong. I remember um, um, being physically hit because one time I had placed, um, uh, uh, a toilet paper, uh, roll the wrong way. You know, it's supposed to go over, not under type thing. And, um, uh, it's taken me a long time to kind of work through that and realize that that person that was abusing, um, me, I want to be very specific. It wasn't any family member in my, in my, um, uh, immediate household. Uh, but, uh, I remember thinking to myself, you know, that was their issue. You know, that's, that's what they were dealing with. That's something that maybe, um, they were just messed up. <laughs> and, uh, and that had nothing to, to do with the fact that I didn't know how the hell to put a toilet paper roll on, on, uh, you know, in the bathroom or do anything else. And, you know, so maybe it's not necessarily body specific, but I mean, it definitely is, is what I've, kind of gone through and what I've been working with and, and have started to kind of make peace with and, you know, apologize to that kid that was kind of um, being harshly uh, physically punished for something that was just ridiculously, uh, a ridiculous reason. Yeah. I mean, um, wow. I, I am close to speechless if that is possible, but um, because I, you know, um, that's a trauma. That is without question a trauma in your life. I'm glad you're doing work on it. And it could be part of your life's work. You could be working on that forever. And that's okay. Um, It is absolutely related to your relationship with your body. Because remember, this is about well-being. It's outside of the way you look. you know, And when you're you know, that, you know, having not just physical abuse, I mean, multiple different types of abuse and just traumas like that will absolutely impact mental health, 
and 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 create a more intense fear and irrational processing of certain situations. So, you know, and not to get too psychological on it, but just to help, you know, in a gentle way, make a connection. Um, it's extra difficult for you to feel in these vulnerable situations because if, you know, everybody makes mistakes, I mean, it's debatable that there's a mistake in the perfect way to roll toilet paper over or under, you know, um, mm -hmm. but even so, humans make mistakes and you were taught that if there, if you didn't follow a certain rule or if you, you know, made a certain person in your life angry or, you know, and you probably didn't know what the different rules were even, but that you could in any uncertain time without any sense of how to follow the rules and be the good boy, you could receive painful punishment. And when that happens to a person, especially at a young age where brains are being wired and that, it is all about get, getting to safety. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. In your life, any amount of emotional eating, you know, um, avoidance, any of those things could absolutely be tied back to those past experiences. I think you wanted to say something. No, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And the reason why I was able to share that, you know, especially I want my, my listeners to know is that uh, because I have, you know, really worked to be able to kind of open up and share those types of things. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. I mean, they have definitely led to a lot of, you know, to who I am today. And, and those are the types of things that, you know, when I read your letter, those are the types of things that it, it kind of uh, brought to the surface, you know, and, and again, it's, it's just being able to kind of go back, truly look at at the past, and be able to start making some some serious and meaningful peace with it. And and what I also saw here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is almost a sense of gratitude for what you had gone through because it has made you who you are today. Uh, am I wrong in saying that? And I don't mean, you know, overly applauding the the, the battles that you or, or the journey that you've had, but definitely giving them a place. Well, you know, this is reminding me of post-traumatic growth. Um, that's what I identify with this as, which you can um, – we read about it in the Upside of Stress book that mm -hmm. we had in book club here, um, and um, you could you can do some research on it. I'll see if I can uh, include one or two links in the show notes um, about it. But let me take your scenario first. No one ever would expect you to say, "I'm so glad I got hit." No, you know, yeah, yeah. that that's not it. Um, but post-traumatic growth is when a person can say, if it weren't for these really horrible experiences in my life, I don't know if I would be who I am today. I wouldn't have made certain decisions. I wouldn't have taken certain risks in my life, which I am so grateful for where I've landed, you know, that I have learned and grown from that experience. So, and I think that is what, how I would take it. And I think that we have a shared experience in that regard, right? Like, so it's not that you're so happy that a bad thing happened to you, but that, you know, and maybe you're kind of like more in the middle. I think for you, what has always been so important I think one of your highest values is the kind of dad you want to be. And I think that you absolutely want to break the chain anywhere where you feel you've been wronged. I think that's why you're thinking about enjoying the beach and water with your daughter and what you need to do to get to that point. Um, and, 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 and certainly you could probably give me a laundry list in ways in which you swore that you would not be like other people who have hurt you in your life because you know you didn't deserve it as a child and you know that that people deserve better and you know how to make it right but you know 
can you start to think of ways that going through traumatic experiences in your life has made you a stronger, more resilient, better person and your life more meaningful. That's what I would start to look for. And that is yeah. how you can find a gratitude. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, when I when I said that, I, to, uh, to be very clear, I wasn't necessarily um, referencing it back to my situation. I, I wasn't grateful for that physical abuse that I, I, I did go, go through. Um, but to follow what you said secondly was, uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel a lot more um, – stronger I feel more empowered and, and I, I I don't I no longer view that as something that was I don't allow it to be you know it's it's not my fault it wasn't my fault you know uh, I know that and I can say that with 100 percent honesty and and um, I've been able to move past it and make peace with it um, you know to be clear it was a, it was a caregiver as soon as that situation was found out um, that person was completely removed from my life and that's a, a huge credit to the strong and, and and wonderful family that I have. Um, but yeah, there are definitely things that I want to make sure, uh, especially being a father that aren't repeated and that I, 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 I um, am able to be completely different and, and incorporate wonderful things into her life. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That list is pretty strong. What I saw and, and the reason why I brought it up when in relation to the, to the post that you put out there was, you know, um, uh, you just really document, I felt you documented well, um, um, just kind of who you were at different stages, what you went through. You even go through the number count 12, 13, 14, you know, and then you, you just, you, you paint such a clear picture. I mean, there, and literally you show one, there's a, a curly haired girl, you know, that literally just had a great time making. Drinking that lake water. <laughs> Drinking I, lake water. So it's brown. Listeners, please. <laughs> I'm urging you to go and check out this post because it, it is colorfully uh, um, uh, dotted with with some great pictures. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you went through in in your writing just a really nice um, synopsis of 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 your life as pertains to to what you've dealt with with this up and down and you know stigma around what you, you know, weight and things. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, I found it to be extremely helpful. I, I really did. And, and it has brought me to, to focus on uh, more so on, on what it is that, that I want to do and be and the experiences that I want to work towards uh, for me and my family. So I do thank you for that. I, I, I definitely do. And I, I really enjoyed the article on, on a lot of levels. Well, you're welcome. And um, I now remember what I was going to say. I was going to help connect back to, um, your apology and that consider maybe what your the nature of your apology because I know you said and acknowledge you know um, hey I know it wasn't my fault and all that and, and are doing your own work privately that's amazing keep doing it um, we're all always works in progress um, but maybe it's more of the nature of here are certain moments where I did my best to protect you and I apologize if what I was doing wasn't really protection. So if you can tie that back to, um, you know, um, any sort of um, regrets that you might have about your attitudes and behaviors around food or your attitudes and behaviors around exercise whether it was yesterday or 15 or 20 years ago, you know? So that that might be the connection of the apology. But I acknowledge just from hearing this part of your story, and I firmly believe that when you, when you engage with avoidance, it is a form of trying to protect yourself. And you're, you're doing the best you can to protect that little boy when he didn't have protection. And so that what you can, it, if you identify things that you were doing that weren't body kindness, no matter how recent or long ago, that the, you know, because that's what I was doing. I was identifying when I kind of had my, you know, epiphany about this wasn't in the name of health, which is disguised that way. There were all these things I was doing that was 
it was a delusion. It was not healthy. And I think in your approach and how you might want to do the apology or listeners doing the apology for you specifically, what I see, and it's just my opinion, but what I see is the connection of, um, I've always wanted to protect you and I've done my best to protect you. And there are some things that I now regret that was my best way of protecting you at the time, but now I don't necessarily see that way because eating should be about this and exercise should be about this. Oh, absolutely. The absolutely. beach should be and, about and, this. And not just protecting myself, Rebecca, but I had a younger brother. So, I mean, a lot of the things that I was I was doing um, were also uh, to, to possibly protect him as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely am hearing what you're saying, and I, I do feel that that could uh, be useful in, in, in the way that maybe I need to go ahead and start looking at it and, and begin apologizing to myself for this. And, and for our listeners out there, you know, Rebecca and I have both shared um, some pretty um, personal things, and I, I do hope that you're able to gain um, from what we've shared and that you're able to start really uh, looking for places in your life where you can revisit and, and, and apologize, make peace. And I think Rebecca has a great challenge uh, that was outlined in her post. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear um, everybody's story out there. So please be sure to to visit the website, email us. I um, I know that there's other people that have benefited from from your article, Rebecca, and I'd love to hear what they have to share. Yeah, I'm very interested uh, to hearing um, apologies if you blog about it or send us a note. Uh, I would love to um, take a look and, you know, we can get conversation going um, on the blog post as well uh, when that goes up with the show. Um, and, you know, I think kind of one, just to deliver on the last aspect of, of the promise for the chat today, um, it's, you know why you want to do it and how it can help you in your body kindness practice. So do you have any personal thoughts or insight based on our conversation so far on how you think making peace with your inner child, you know, embracing your body as it is right now, making amends, kind of freeing yourself brick by brick, having an apology, is there any ways that you can think of that doing that could help you on your continued journey of body kindness? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things just, uh, first of all, for myself, you know, you talk about brick by brick, brick building up this room of isolation. And I felt that I've, you know, I have done that in my past and, and, you know, those, those, those rooms and those walls still exist. And I think that by being able to really apologize to myself, I'm going to start to exactly free myself from, from that isolation. Um, so I need to do that for myself first and foremost, because I just don't want to be somebody, a dad who preaches, you know, what it should be like and not live by these things. I think that eventually, you know, there's that saying, you know, kids don't do what we say, they do what we do. And, you know, I want to make sure that I'm, um, uh, being true to what it is that I, I, I want to share with my daughter um, as she grows up. So for myself, first and foremost, and, for, and secondly, I just, I, I really don't want to think twice about doing anything with my family or family members or friends or colleagues or uh, nothing. I, I don't want to think twice unless, you know, unless it's seriously jumping out of a plane without a parachute or, you know, something to that effect. But if it's something that can genuinely bring joy to my life, I don't want to give it a second thought. I just want to be able to engage in it um, and be in the present moment when I'm doing it. Yeah. Well, I heard two goals out of that. Um, I want to be the kind of person who lives his values and values-based living is what creates a more meaningful life. So when you talk about, um, you know, you don't want to be the kind of person who says one thing and does something else. So you turn it into what's the action you would take. I want to be the kind of person who lives according to his values. I value time with my family. I value fully engaging in life. And that kind of parlays in the second one where it's I want to be the kind of person who does the things that bring me joy. And that may mean for you engaging with vulnerability 
Remember, society says you're not allowed to be vulnerable. But mm -hmm. we can ignore society and do the vulnerable thing anyway. So I want to be the kind of person who engages in joyful activities in life. That means you're willing to hold this uncomfortable, difficult, gut-wrenching, yuckety yuck ugh, vulnerability and carry that with you while you do the thing that matters more to you anyway. The time with your kids and your wife and the beach and the, you know, and really practice being the kind of man who is body confident. It's not fake it till you make it. Let yourself be vulnerable while you practice being the kind of man who doesn't care what people think, who will, you know, be on the beach or pool or wherever enjoying life. Let yourself feel that difficulty and discomfort. Now you're no longer avoiding, right? And now you're actually living your values and, and, and embracing vulnerability and doing what matters most to you. And that is how you beat fear by facing it. Absolutely. And one word that you use that I really, you know, particularly resonated right now was just practice it. And I think that that's what I oftentimes overlook. I, I want to be able to show the world that I have it down. And the truth is, uh, you got to practice <laughs> before you ever get it down. That is and, how uh, you get say, out of it. <laughs> who's to say we'll ever get it down? But if you don't practice, that's a that's a surefire way of never getting it down. So uh, to all our listeners out there, uh, I, I, I hope you can relate to that one, especially because I know that in my mind, there's a lot of scenarios that I will think through and even enjoy um, the experience in my mind having never done it because of maybe a fear. You know, it's almost like that uh, Walter Mitty slash Bridget Jones thinking everything through before you actually do it. Uh, there's times where I've celebrated in my head, like, wow, you did great. And I, I never stepped out to do it. And then there's times like the beach scenario where I'm, you know, completely thinking to myself, God, everybody's going to be talking, but I don't know this because, because I've never, never done it. <laughs> so uh, to all our listeners out there, let's, let's, let's get out there and, and do that. Let's practice um, until we, we are able to make peace. Yeah. <laughs> and if you fall flat on your face, if all your fears happened, you are still a stronger person as a result because you took a risk, you faced your fears, and that's how you get to the next step. Absolutely. And one of my favorite sayings is, if it's not a good time, it's a good story. So be sure to uh, uh, email us. Awesome. <laughs> we turn that around. Awesome. So. Well, with that, we're going to wrap this show up. And just a reminder to our listeners that we want you to go build a healthy and happy life you love and be kind to yourself. If you'd like a free guide to feeling great and a free health and happiness journal, sign up for my email list at RebeccaSpritchfield.com. 